Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of the uh, people in the XRP community. Today I have, after about nine months of hard work, um, working with this channel, trying to be uh, bringing interviews to our XRP community, um, I have a gentleman with us today that has been on my bucket list when I first ran into crypto and it was around 2013. Uh, I ran across who Roger is and what he was all about. And uh, he was affectionately known or maybe still is known as Bitcoin Jesus. And it is an honor and a pleasure to introduce uh, to everyone one of the pioneers of the crypto space. And Roger, would you like to introduce yourself and say hello to everyone? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh I'd actually, uh, I think I have some XRP stories we can talk about today that I don't think I've ever talked about publicly before. So maybe people will find those interesting uh, as well. Well, and I'm very much looking forward to that. And I've always been fascinated that, I, and if I get the number incorrect, then you can correct me, but I believe you were the third person that became involved with Ripple. Is that close? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I was the second person. So so maybe we should jump right into that that story there. So then take um, take off. You share your stories and I'll just listen. Yes. Yeah, so, so as as I think most you know XRP or Ripple fans know, Jed McCaleb was uh, the original brains behind it and came up with the idea. But this would have been back probably in early 2012. Uh, Jed reached out to me uh, one one day. I was. I was actually back visiting in California at the time, I think, or, or I was a couple of days away from heading to California, actually. That, that's what it was. I was in Japan when he reached out to me and he said, hey, I've seen everything you're doing in the Bitcoin space. Uh, I have an idea on how to make Bitcoin that doesn't require mining. He said, uh, he said that he thinks mining is wasteful. And so he wants to make a version of Bitcoin that doesn't require any mining. And so my initial response was, sounds great. Uh, how can I help? Right. So he said, well, let's let's get together and, and meet for that. And I said, well, I, and he was in living in the Berkeley area at the time. And I said, well, actually, I'm, I'm headed to California in, you know, two or three days in the future or something like that. So I said, why don't we meet up this, uh, you know, this coming week once I'm back in California from Tokyo. So I arrived in California and we had agreed to meet for lunch at a Korean restaurant. Uh, and I think we were supposed to meet at, I don't know, 11 a.m. or noon or something like that. And uh you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good at plenty of things in life, but dealing with jet lag is not one of them. And so I, I still feel horrible to this very day. I, we were supposed to meet at 11 and the jet lag just caught up with me. And I, I didn't just oversleep by a little bit. I overslept by a lot. Wow. And uh, I was supposed to be there at 11. And I think I didn't wake up that day until maybe two in the afternoon or something like that. And so, Roger, what you're telling me is, is we were all this close from none of this happening because of Roger Veer's jet lag. <laughs> but 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 to Jed's credit, he was he was so gracious. And when I woke up, I contacted him and said, Oh my God, I'm you know two or three hours late for a meeting. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I told him I can come now if, if that still works for you. And he said, Yeah, sure, no, no problem. So it was about an hour drive uh, from from where I was as well. And so I drove and, and we had lunch and he you know presented his his vision for for XRP. And at the time it didn't even have a name. Uh, it was just called New Coin, and in fact, the folder I, I created on my hard drive to keep track of all the what eventually became XRP and Ripple stuff was called New Coin for a long, long time. And I think even our contract, our initial con first contract, there was just called New Coin was uh, what we were referring to, to XRP and Ripple in that contract. But uh, Jed definitely had uh, had the vision and uh, was really, really good at connecting the right people uh, to make things happen. So I actually paid the salary. Um, for uh joel katz is his screen name and uh, his 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 real name always escapes me because i originally know him from the from the um bitcoin talk forums in the early david, days so. david, david schwartz david schwartz thank you so his screen name was uh was was joel katz on the bitcoin talk forums and i remember if for anybody that you know everybody in, in xrp knows what what he looks like now but uh he looks like the stereotypical you know computer nerd programmer is you know he has long hair and not as much hair on top and you know looks kind of like the stereotype mad scientist for crypto stuff and i remember when yep. i met him for the very first time it was at, it was at the bitcoin meetup in silicon valley there that uh, i helped to get started and he showed up in, in person and he said oh i'm i'm joel katz from the forums and uh, 
my initial response, I think, was like, that's your real photo on the forums. Because up to that point, I thought it was just kind of like somebody went on Google image search and tried to find, find the stereotypical image of a cryptographer, you know, crypto nerd image and use that for his profile. But it turned out it was his real profile. Yeah. And, and actually, when you know, talking with him at some point through the whole, you know, birth of, of XRP and Ripple, it occurred to me, it just snapped one day. I said, wait a minute. I met you before. And so I, I had met David Schwartz in maybe the year 2000 at a, a at an artificial intelligence conference in Silicon Valley. And I had a really nice conversation with him. And after chatting with a little bit, it was real clear that he you know leans heavily libertarian. But at that time, he was working as a cryptographer for the NSA. And so I asked him, I said, like, well, if you're such a libertarian, why why are you working at the NSA? That's kind of the opposite of, of you know, what libertarians are supporting. And he got this twinkle in his eye and you know, he rubbed his hands together and he said, because, because they have me working on the most subversive things imaginable. Thought, oh, okay, that's pretty interesting. And, uh, and, and, and yeah, David is just an amazing, amazing guy with such an amazing mind and can just get so many different things done. And uh, it's really, really uh, been fantastic to watch uh, the, the, the path that XRP has managed to you know, become one of the top cryptocurrencies in the entire world out there it's just been an emph- a fantastic uh you know guy at the helm there uh who I, I know from the early days as well uh uh you know right there from the very beginning of of uh of xrp and ripple and a lot of people won't realize that actually when they initially created uh ripple uh there was the you know so-called toxic waste right the cryptographic uh stuff that nobody should get uh uh you know a hold of later if they can cause problems and uh uh, you know, I was one of those those people that were actually involved in that actual creation ceremony there. So uh, it was myself, Jed, uh, David Schwartz, and, and a couple of other people there as well. So way, way, way back, uh, once upon a time. And so uh, it's kind of uh, amazing to see just how far, uh, you know, everyone's calling it XRP now. For me, it's just been, at first it was new coin, and then it still feels like Ripple to me. But it's been amazing to see uh, the path that it goes there. And I, I'm currently more well known for my promotion of Bitcoin Cash, but I'm a, I'm a big fan of absolutely anything that works. And uh, I've made some XRP transactions in my day as well. It works really, really well. And the XRP army is really exciting to, to see just what a great job they're doing at spreading it to the world. So I'm a fan of absolutely anything that works. So uh, kudos to the XRP army for, for doing that. Well, I appreciate that. And so in the, in the beginning, when, when you saw Bitcoin and then you saw uh, as time went along with the innovation of the tech, do you believe that what David Schwartz and Jeb uh, McCaleb created what was a was a next generation solution of the tech w- with cryptocurrency? Um, I think that's probably a better question for for David Schwartz or, or, or Jed at this point. Um, but I know my interactions with with XRP, I fast, cheap, reliable transactions. That's that's what the, I've seen with every time I've tried using it. And if anything, the biggest hindrance, and I guess we can kind of blame this to some extent on, on the U.S. government there as well, um, but the biggest hindrance for XRP adoption is uh, is there aren't really too many consumer-facing wallets at this point. But there's a whole other story behind that that I maybe my lawyers wouldn't be too happy if I talked about it, but I don't really care because uh, you only live life once and it's important to speak the truth. So shoot, I don't know, in the year 2013 or 14 now, it's, and it's been a while, um, the U.S. government, I, I'm, they, they don't like me because I'm not a fan of, of governments in general. I think people should have control of their own lives and they shouldn't need permission from any politician to be able to send or receive any amount of money with anyone anywhere on the planet. And that's what made me so excited about Bitcoin, so excited about XRP, so excited about Monero, so excited about Bitcoin Cash and Ethereum and Dash and take your pick. I'm excited about this entire ecosystem because I want to empower individuals to have more control over their own lives. And so I was literally the second person ever to be involved in Ripple or XRP. Uh, at the time that this happened, I think I was the third largest in the company itself. And uh, you know, I saw all the great stuff that was going on with Ripple and XRP, and I didn't own any of the actual tokens themselves. I only owned part of the company. So I reached out to, to Chris Larson and I said, hey, Chris, like, I see all the great stuff you guys have going on. This is fantastic, but uh, I want I want to own more of this. I want to own some of the XRP tokens because right now I don't own any of them. I only own some shares in the company itself. 
And I said, can you sell me some, some XRP? And they said, yeah, sure, no problem. And he just, uh, you know, emailed over to me their standard onboarding like packet, which was like, I don't know, a 10 page PDF asking for, you know, every last different detail and question about you. And, and I replied to him and I said like, Hey, it's, it's not like you guys don't know who I am. I'm, I'm a public figure in the space. I helped set up the company. You don't need this 10 page long document from, from me in regards to do this. And he's like, you're absolutely right, Roger, no problem at all. Uh, and so then they sold me some XRP and, and it was the, I said, paid him by wire transfer. Like everything was nice and smooth and, and easy. I might have paid by Bitcoin. I don't remember if it was wire transfer or Bitcoin, to be honest. It's been so long at, at this point. But everything was great. And then uh, a couple of years later, you know, some you know federal prosecutor had a bee in her bonnet or whatever and really, really wanted to go uh, after Ripple. And they really insisted that, uh, that I be part of that. And they tried to spin the whole thing around, claiming that I strong-armed the executive team at Ripple into not abiding by their KYC practices and just a whole bunch of nonsense. And they negotiated for a long time with the eventual consent uh, agreement there that they signed. And uh, the United States government wouldn't budge one bit about you know, having me in it because they wanted to demonize me as if I was some sort of bad guy for wanting to invest in cryptocurrencies and own cryptocurrencies. It's just absolute nonsense and just shows what a bunch of hypocrites the United States government are. I, they love to point out how China is you know, horrible on, on allowing free speech and the way they're treating the Olgers and this and that. And like, they're right. But then look at what the U.S. government's doing to Edward Snowden or Julian Assange or any of these other guys in the West. They just turn a complete blind eye to, to the almost the exact same sort of thing that they're doing over here. So, uh, you know, two wrongs don't make a right. And if there's one bully in the East, that doesn't mean it's okay for there to be a bully in the West. Uh, in the West. Uh, a bully is a bully is a bully no matter where they are in the world. And uh, I'm excited about cryptocurrencies because it takes away power from the bullies to bully people. And uh, that's why I love XRP and Bitcoin Cash and all, all of these things. It's just a, a fantastic tool to empower the individual against the bullies in the world. Well, and Roger, I uh, uh, am a uh, brother in kind with the libertarian um, belief and, and viewpoint. I'm a libertarian as well. And, but do you believe that, um, that the more libertarian and the more anarchist, the crypto project that they're going to have more pushback from the powers that be like the central banks and the governments and all of those people, because one of the things that people do not like about Ripple and XRP is they look at it as the banker's coin and that they are working within the system to try to make it better. And that's one of the reasons that people don't like Ripple and XRP. So, but, but again, do you believe that anything is going to happen mass adoption wise without the cooperation of the central governments and the banks? No, I, I think you have to cooperate. And I, I don't know, I can't speak for Brad Garlinghouse's intent. I, I don't know him well. I've I only met him, I think, once and I, you know, follow him on Twitter and whatnot. Um, but I kind of view cryptocurrencies in general, uh, you have to work within the system. But if, you know, for those of us that remember the original Aliens movie, right, the alien was inside the human system. And before you knew it, the alien popped out and took over everything. And I kind of feel like that's what cryptocurrencies are for the, for the world's central banking system. They're inside and you have to work within the system and grow and grow and grow until you can just pop out and run the show yourselves uh, on cryptocurrency. And that was one of the real giant setbacks for XRP, though, was in that consent agreement. Uh, the United States government basically forced Ripple to not be allowed to have a consumer facing wallet that they funded themselves. And that's why you don't have the, the, you know, the Ripple wallet that's put out by the Ripple uh, company or uh, and that's been a giant setback for for XRP and so you can you know point right there to the US government there they are delaying the adoption of technology that can improve the lives of every single human being on the planet so uh, one more reason why yeah I guess we need to work within the system here but like let's replace the system with a new and better one that empowers everybody all over the planet and uh, and uh, I don't have you know any problem whatsoever with Ripple being a part of that or XRP being a part of that. And let you know a thousand different flowers bloom. You have XRP, you have Litecoin, you have Bitcoin Cash, you have everything. Uh, and so you know, give them all a try. Whichever ones work, fantastic. And uh, I'm, I've never ever ever been a, a Bitcoin maximalist ever, as shown by the fact that I helped you know literally I helped fund uh, the creation of XRP and a number of other cryptocurrencies out there as well. Uh, I just want something that works as peer-to-peer -peer cash for the world, whether it's XRP or anything else. Uh, it's okay by me as long as we have it sooner rather than later. Well, and from the regulation standpoint, do you believe that they are coming around, the regulators and the governments? Because, I mean, the world economy right now with the fractional uh, uh, fiat system that we have in place now, 
it, it's looking pretty grim out there. <laughs> Yeah, I think the writing is on the wall. Cryptocurrencies are here to stay. They are not going anywhere. And at the end of the day, the ones that are the most useful to the most number of people are going to be the ones that have the most success. And to be useful to a lot of people, you have to have fast, cheap, reliable payments uh, as well. And you have to have a big network effect. And so the way I see it right now, Bitcoin has the biggest network effect and the biggest market cap and the most liquidity, but an absolutely horrible user experience. For anybody that's tried sending or receiving Bitcoin, that user experience is horrible. Uh, uh, XRP has a really, really good user experience, but a much, much smaller network effect in terms of the amount of merchants and wallets and, and exchanges and, and that sort of thing that are using it. And the amount of liquidity there is much smaller. Uh, Bitcoin Cash is in there with a smaller network effect and less liquidity, but a fantastic user experience as well. And then you have other coins like Monero, like that one's really, really interesting as well with a really strong privacy right there. But it almost makes me wonder if it's too strong a privacy. And so it's, you've, we've already seen different exchanges in different countries be forbidden by the government from listing Monero because the privacy is so strong. So, but I, I think it's great that we have Bitcoin and XRP and Monero and Bitcoin Cash and all of these things because eventually one of them or multiple of them are going to have a real big breakthrough into mainstream uh, adoption and usage around the world. And that's a fantastic thing because then people won't be dependent on uh, these central bankers. They can print as much money at any time for any reason and give it out to all their political buddies uh, while the rest of us have the money that we have devalued. Uh, and that's a big, a big giant problem for the world. And cryptocurrencies have the ability to solve that problem. So that's why I'm, a, I'm such a big fan. Right. And um, when did we, what, what was your uh, take when you saw that Brian Brooks had become uh, the comptroller of the currency with the OCC? Did you feel like that that was a move in the right direction for all of crypto? Because I really felt like that that was kind of a watershed moment when we've got a gentleman that used to work at Coinbase and now is the person <clears throat> telling the banks what their regulations are going to be and that now the U.S. banks can custody crypto. I think that, that uh, if U.S. banks can custody crypto, that's fantastic. I think the more people that are allowed to use crypto, uh, the better. We want anybody and everybody all over the world to have the option to be able to use whatever is the most useful form of money uh, to them. So whether it's you know red bricks stacked in a pile behind your backyard or XRP or something else out there, people need to have the, the, the freedom to choose. Uh, but that's what really concerns me so much, though, too. Like we saw in the United States, the United States government literally forbid people from owning gold and told everybody they had to turn in their gold. If everybody's forced to use custodial cryptocurrency solutions because there's not enough on-chain capacity where everybody has to keep their Bitcoin in a Coinbase account, don't think that the U.S. government wouldn't go to Coinbase and say, give us all your Bitcoin, just like they went to everybody else previously and said, give us all your gold. And so that's why I'm such a big fan of cryptocurrencies that actually allow people to, to have the cryptocurrency themselves in their own wallet. Uh, things like XRP or, or, or Bitcoin Cash are fantastic examples of that. Right. And um, on a timeline of adoption, do you kind of, since you were here from the beginning, um, do you feel like that we are closer now to what you hoped that this would be when you first saw it as one of the pioneers of the, of the crypto space? I, we're definitely closer, but we're still a long ways away. And I, the part that's the most frustrating for me is there was this nasty civil war within Bitcoin that I think delayed the adoption of all cryptocurrencies, not just Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash, but it delayed the adoption of all cryptocurrencies by at least half a decade here. So I think we could have been much, much, much farther along the line of a uh, world currency adoption than we are today if, uh, if there hadn't been that nasty civil war within Bitcoin. So that's probably the thing right. that was the biggest disappointment for me within, uh, within well, the, my experience. And, and Roger, I think you're one of the people too that, um, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but... Um, proof of work kind of has a challenge now of being a workable tech. And again, I, um, I'm, I really am a big fan of yours. I did watch your video that you did the transactions at the coffee shop. And I mean, dude, you can't, when you move $20 back and forth and your fees are tw over $12, that's just not scalable. <laughs> so, I mean, do, so do you have any comments at all, all on, on, on your take on proof of work? Yeah, so uh, I think the biggest thing is, is that people should actually go out there and try using these different cryptocurrencies. Use XRP and use all these other ones and, and use the one that actually works. Like there's so many people, I see them all over the place, uh, you know, promoting BTC and promoting Lightning Network. 
they obviously hadn't haven't used either one or they wouldn't be out there promoting it because the the user experience is absolutely atrocious. I would be embarrassed to start promoting BTC today to tell people, hey, you can you can use this currency and it only costs you six dollars per transaction and it might get reversed <laughs> for the next week. And uh, so I couldn't I, I would be a snake oil salesman if I was trying to promote something like that. Yet it has the name recognition and brand awareness around the world where today, you know, people are focused on that one. But the user experience with XRP or Bitcoin Cash or a whole bunch of other cryptocurrencies out there are head and shoulders above. So I really invite people to go out there and actually try using the different cryptocurrencies. And you'll be able to see for yourself which ones actually work and which ones are just a bunch of vaporware and uh, toxic people on Twitter attacking anybody who doesn't like uh uh, doesn't like their preferred cryptocurrency of choice. Well, you know, Roger, I'm I'm not so much um, against the Bitcoin part, but the maxi attitude part is just something that really drives me up the wall. And I don't know whether that just comes from the fact that, I mean, as a libertarian, I like to try to evaluate things with an open mind, not just be a, a, a believer in something and just go about it blindly. And uh, I was having a, a discussion in Twitter yesterday with a guy that I like and respect, but he really loves Bitcoin. And I asked him, is what Satoshi put in his white paper the reality that we have now? Did Satoshi have in mind 65% mined in China, high fees, slow transaction times, and using an enormous amount of energy? I said, which part of the reality of Bitcoin right now today do you feel comfortable encouraging other people to put their hard-earned money into it? And he came back and responded, well, I don't like any of those things. And I said, well, then what is it you're recommending? That says that a lot. <laughs> Bitcoin for? No answer. <laughs> so I, I, I don't. So let me ask that to you in a different way. Do you believe that the reality of Bitcoin today is what Satoshi, whether that was Craig Wright, haha, -ha, or a group of people or whoever Satoshi was, do you think that the intent that they had when they wrote the white paper is the reality that we have with Bitcoin today? Yeah, clearly not. The very title of the Bitcoin white paper written by Satoshi Nakamoto was a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Bitcoin no longer works as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system and the developers behind it aren't even trying to have it be a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. They're, they're openly opposed to people being able to spend it and, and use it on things. Their entire mantra at this point is just hold it. And so uh, so if anybody's being fooled or tricked, it's thinking that uh, that BTC is, is, is Bitcoin. Uh, it's not at this point. It just it has the Bitcoin name, uh, but it doesn't it's, it's not even remotely. Uh, uh, similar to what was described in the original Bitcoin uh, white paper. So uh, XRP is uh, much closer to Bitcoin at this point than what everybody's calling Bitcoin. And, and Roger, uh, um, another project um, that is very popular out there is Ethereum. And when Vitalik is putting together 2.0, do you believe that that is a movement away from proof of work? Because again, it just doesn't seem that that, that technology is scalable. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. That's a job for uh, Vitalik and the other engineers to, to figure out just how they can scale Ethereum with Ethereum 2.0. But uh, I hold lots of ETH and I'm, I'm eagerly waiting and hoping and uh, uh, I'm a perpetual optimist. So I'm optimistic about the entire space and what uh, amazing things these amazing people are going to be able to do. Well, and as the Internet of everything and the Internet of value continues to develop, I mean, h how big do you see what we are all involved in? And again, the thing that is the most interesting to me is that, I mean, you're one of the pioneers of all of this. I mean, when you wake up every day and just realize your place in history, I mean, that—that that is, I mean, as a, as, an, as a person with an ego, I'm like, man, how that must feel every day when you wake up and know that you are one of the pioneers of the internet of everything and the internet of value. I mean, do, do, do you wake up every day smiling and remind yourself of that? No, actually, I, I pretty much never think of that. What I do think about is like, how can we, what tools can we build today to bring more economic freedom to people all over the world where they can do what they want with their own money? And what actions can I take today to, to help move that goal forward? And so I'm, I'm too busy, you know, trying to build those tools and work on these things to, to enable people to actually have more control over their own money than to 
to stop and, and, and think back and reflect on what, uh, what I've already accomplished. So maybe someday I'll have some time to do that, but uh, that, that day is not here yet. I'm still too busy uh, trying to build the tools to, to enable these things. And so, Roger, what are the things, if you'd like to share with everyone, what are the things that you're working on right now, if you care to share that? What are sure. the things that you're waking up with and then trying to, to, to accomplish um, during your waking hours these days? Sure. And so there's only so many hours in each day. So I haven't been able to follow the XRP news closely, but I'm not aware of good on-chain privacy tools for XRP to have private transactions. Bitcoin Cash has this amazing tool called Cash Fusion. You can go to cashfusion.org and download the client for your desktop today. And we'll have it available inside the Bitcoin.com wallet here soon. Where your transactions, there's literally more ways your coins could have been shuffled up uh, than there are atoms in the entire universe. So that's a really, really big number. So you'll be able to have super, super, super private uh, transactions on Bitcoin Cash where the, you know, the NSA and IRS and everybody else can't spy on what you're up to. And it'll be available to everybody with a Bitcoin.com wallet. So you'll have not only fast, cheap, reliable transactions, but it'll be fast, cheap, reliable and super, super private. And so that's one of the things that uh, I'm the most excited about for Bitcoin Cash. And then, of course, the tokens on the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem are a really big deal as, as well. Uh, fast, cheap, reliable token payments and anybody can make their own token in like 30 seconds over at mint.bitcoin.com, M-I-N-T.bitcoin.com. I'm really excited about those. And I've mentioned it before and I'll, I'll mention again, I, it's definitely been on our radar for consideration. Like we've, we've toyed with the idea of adding XRP to the bitcoin.com wallet. And that's something that, that seems fun and worth doing. The problem is there's just so many other things to do every day as well. So it, it, it's on our long list of things to do at some point. But, uh, but yeah, that would be fun too as well. And globally, um, to backtrack just a little bit, do you believe that the pandemic has helped usher in the speed of which that the governments and the regulators want to take a look at the solution of cryptocurrency uh, and push it along a little bit further? I, I feel like it's accelerated the process. Um, do, yeah, how do you I've, feel about that? I've, I've seen directly the, the web traffic stats. When the worldwide lockdown began, everybody was stuck at home on their computer. So way more people started researching this cryptocurrency stuff and they were visiting Bitcoin.com and other web, websites related to cryptocurrency. So it definitely helped drive it forward uh, from, from that perspective. Uh, the downside of this, though, too, is that like the government's literally like strangling the entire worldwide uh, economy over the fear of, uh, you know, it's a real disease and real people have died from the disease, but the government reaction has been far, far worse than the disease. And more people are probably going to die from the government reaction to the disease than the actual disease itself. And so uh, I'd love to see cryptocurrencies start disempowering these politicians from being able to control peaceful people. If you want to self-isolate and stay at home wearing a mask, go for it. Uh, but don't force everybody else to do the same thing. People can decide what their own appropriate risk level uh, to take in the world is. And so... Uh, I want to see cryptocurrencies empower the individuals to be able to make those choices and, and disempower these hypocrite politicians like we saw Nancy Pelosi trying to force everybody to stay at home wearing a mask while she's at the hair salon not wearing a mask. I mean, what a bunch of, what a, what a fantastic exa example of hypocrisy out there. So. I, I couldn't agree more. And um, one of the things, too, that, that I've been hearing on my radar lately is uh, Elon Musk putting together something called Starlink to possibly set the economic system up in space so nobody can put out a, a, a EMP to knock out the electronic grid. Do, do you feel like that we're moving towards having everything up on satellite so it can't be messed with? I'm clearly more and more stuff's going on in space. I, I hadn't thought about the idea of Starlink being able to protect us from EMP stuff. I, I think the problem is that all the people on the ground with their electronics would still be affected, even if the satellites are still up and running. So I, I, I'll have to give that some more thought. But uh, the more useful tools that people have in the world to talk to each other and do payments with each other, the, the better. And uh, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm real excited about Starlink as well and, and uh, Neuralink. And uh, it's just so fantastic that the world has these uh, you know great minds that can go out there and figure out how to do great things. because the rest of us all benefit from it. And I think anybody that studies economics realizes that anytime any businessman, you know, becomes a billionaire or, or does something like that, it's because they have things that they gave to the world, the world values far more than the money that they gave to them. And so, yeah, you know, Tesla's had some subsidies and this and that, but uh, and, and those subsidies aren't appropriate. But uh, overall, you know, 
look how much better my life is because I have an iPhone here, right? And, uh, you know, Apple is one of the you know, wealthiest countries in the entire world or companies in the entire world because they gave the entire world these amazing tools that they get to use to improve their lives. So like, yeah, I, I gave Apple a bunch of my money, but it's because I value their, you know, the phones, and the computers that they've given me more than I value the money that they've given, uh, that, that, uh, that, that I gave them. And so this is just a fantastic example of time and time again, anytime anything happens in the free market, both people are better off after the exchange. Otherwise, the exchange wouldn't happen. And uh, and when when government diverts resources and time and money and effort away from the free market, uh, they're diverting those resources uh, away from the best use case there. Uh, and, and that's a real unfortunate thing. And that's why cryptocurrencies are so exciting, because it'll make it more difficult for government to divert resources away from the free market to their own ends. I mean, look at look at how much money NASA has wasted over the years. Imagine if all that money had still been in the private sector and the rate of economic growth had been, you know, slightly larger than it has been over the last couple of decades. Maybe right. Elon Musk, maybe the Starlink system would have been, you know, in orbit a decade ago already, and we would have had it for the last ten years already. Or who knows what other diseases or no, other other things that they would have been able to figure out how to cure or problems would have been solved already. And so you have to look at not just what's Seen. Like, yeah, NASA put people on the moon and they have space shuttles and that's cool. But what would have happened if all that capital hadn't been sucked out of the world's economy and diverted towards that? What other amazing things would have come into existence that we don't know about today because they, they misallocated all those resources to things that, frankly, people didn't uh, value all that much. Otherwise, they would have been able to, to donate all that money voluntarily and you wouldn't have had the government uh, needing to do that by uh, you know threatening to toss people in jail if they didn't pay. So uh, I'm a big, big fan of the free market and uh, I'm opposed to any time uh, the government violently interjects itself into the market because uh, free people make everybody's lives better off and uh, violent interjection into the economy uh, retards the world's rate of economic growth and prevents the world from being as good of a place as it otherwise would have been. Uh, and Roger, one of the things also that's been on most everyone's radar lately has been um, quantum computing. And do you see the quantum computing being able to kind of thwart the progress of the tech that is being utilized right now in the cryptocurrency space? Personally, I feel like that quantum computing could have an effect, but I don't believe that that's a concern that we all ought to be having right now. I don't think that the quantum computing is quite ready yet, and it will still give the cryptographers in the crypto space time to be able to work on being able to avert that as a, as a potential threat. Yeah, I, David Schwartz is a better guy to talk with about that than myself. But my understanding is when you know quantum computers have enough qubits to, to do cert certain things here, it'll close some crypt current cryptographical tools from being used, but it'll open new doors where there's new new algorithms that are able to be used. So it's just one more step in, in the, the path forward for, for human progress. And maybe we would have had, you know, quantum computers with thousands of qubits already if the government hadn't been retarding the rate of economic growth for the last, you know, several centuries there. So, uh, you know, the, we should be striving to, to create new technologies as fast as we possibly can. Uh, we, we don't want to slow down the inevitable because just look around. The world's getting better and better for more and more people year after year. Uh, I'm old enough to remember this iPhone would have been absolute magic when I was a kid. I remember my first, even before Nintendo, we had a Pong thing with knobs you would twist there. Uh, and and yeah, yeah you, you remember those too. Look at how far we've come and things are just getting better and better for people all over the world year after year. So, And cryptocurrencies are a powerful tool to help speed up that uh, pace of progress around the world. Well, Roger, I'm a little bit older than you. And um, I grew up in an age where my television had three stations a, a four, ABC, NBC, CBS, and then on UHF, we could pick up channel 19, um, which was, you know, an alternative local station, um, kind of like Fox, you know, the fourth network at that time. <clears throat> and my, my toy to be able to play with, like, you know, we can play with this now, was an, a magic eight ball. <laughs> So that's how far back I go. My my little toy like this was growing up as a kid was a magic eight ball. <laughs> <laughs> I remember seeing those as, as well at one point, but uh, I'm glad you're keeping up with the technology of the times and you have your XRP and your iPhone and your green screen and uh, video casting uh, around the world now. So uh, and I think that's what all of us should strive to do is, is uh, keep up with the times. I, oh, and I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I'm 58, but I'm I uh, read a book in my 20s about paradigm shifting and it just captivated me. And so for the last 35 years, I've always kind of been looking and lurking and watching 
for any paradigms that seem to be shifting. And right now in the world, that's why I wake up with a big smile on my face every day. I see more paradigms converging, being shifting right now to make the world a better, more connected place than I ever have in my entire lifetime. And I know that there's some people that are concerned about this uh, growth of technology in our lives, but I look at it like if it makes it more convenient for the human being, they're going to utilize it. And that's how I see all these changes being made. And I'm, like I said, Roger, I wake up every day more excited at 58 than at any other time since I've been alive. That's exactly how I feel as well. Every day is just so exciting. What new amazing things are coming out into the world today. So, uh, yeah, that's what an exciting time to be alive for all of us. Well put. And, and I think, Roger, um, I don't want to overtake my uh, your gracious time. And so as we wind up, do you have any kind of a final message that you would like to be able to send out um, to the world? And um, again, I cannot I, the, the, I could thank you for a thousand years for making this uh, my another one on my bucket list that I get to check off. You really do have no idea what an honor it is that, that you decided to share some of your time today with me. And uh, I hope well, we'll be able to get together again um, some date in the future to be able to evaluate where we were the first time that we got to talk on September 15th, 2020. And, you know, where where we have moved along the the adoption of, of crypto uh, in the world. So do you have any final words that you'd like to share with everyone as we uh, as we kind of wrap this up? Yeah, I, you mentioned always looking for the new paradigm and what's the new paradigm? Well, if you don't keep an open mind and if you're not willing to try new things, you're gonna miss that new paradigm. So it's really, really important to keep an open mind to be willing to try new things in order to be able to, to see that new paradigm coming uh, before the rest of the world uh, notices it. So uh, I think that's your own advice that I just restated for the channel, but uh, thank you for, for giving that accurate advice to the world. All right. Well, again, Roger, thank you. And I, I hope that we can continue this conversation uh, at some time at a later date. Uh, and again, I cannot thank you enough from the bottom of my heart um, for you being willing to share some of your time with me today. Yeah, I look forward to the next time. Thank you very, very much as well. Okay. Take care, Roger.